Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Boz on Tuesday night. Welcome uh, to the night of September 12th. Uh, we are talking about lies from behind that exam room door. Are you lying? Is your doctor lying? And is there a better way to do this? It is a common question. Doc, I don't know how to tell. Oh, they'll ask me. Dr. Boz, I don't know how to tell my doctor I'm keto. Should I just lie? <laughs> uh, and it, it's just easier. And it's not the confrontation. My doctor doesn't know about keto anyway. Uh, the second way this goes is they're in the middle of a... Um, Oh, I'm trying to check my blood sugar here. They're in the middle of a transition, and oftentimes they know a little bit more about what's going on with the keto diet than their doctor does. Yeah, glucose is 56 and ketones are 2.3. I have been fasting since Sunday, and can anybody else tell <laughs> that I am prepared and ready for my 21-day challenge, which this is the second day that we've met students. It's been fantastic. We are not talking about that tonight, but I am super thankful that I have met so many wonderful new students that uh, it's, it's been a great day for me, great two days for us here on the Dr. Bob Show. Uh, I see lots of folks out there. Urquay, I've actually never, I'd have to look up, where is Urquay? But I know where Ohio is and Jacksonville and Texas, so good to see all, all of you out there. Uh, you know, the common question that I get often is, uh, Dr. Boz, when... Um, I was with my doctor. Um, this is the this is what happened. Uh, the example I'm going to give tonight is well from somebody in my support group this morning here at the Pin Chasers in in Tampa. Pin Chasers is the name of the bowling alley. And um, well, if you want a free support group led by me, show up in Tampa at 4809 North Armenia and join us at the Pin Chasers. But because of the the 21 day course we started at 7 30 this morning and one of the folks there was a retired teacher an english teacher and he said yeah i in my retirement i showed up to my doctor six months ago and i have five prescriptions i'm now taking because of all these health problems my retirement isn't growing going like i thought it should and as he's behind the exam room door he says um yeah, the first thing he did was look at my labs and saw that my hemoglobin A1C was 12. And he said, here is another prescription. We need you to take this medication. As he tried to argue with his doctor, like, I just want to do this natural. I want to do this without any prescriptions. Well, his doctor was almost like laughing at him. Like, there's no way. There's no way to reverse what you've got going on. This is beyond reversal with your natural remedies. And he went to write the prescription. So the doctor's lying, or is he? And why is he lying? Doctors do lie. We take an oath not to do any harm, but it doesn't mean harm doesn't happen. And the, um, the, the truth is that the doctor is worried about this guy's longevity, about his death rate. And his death rate is quite high. Is it the best thing for him to offer him another prescription? Or is there a better way that he should be uh, navigating this? So um, Frank is not going to come back from this. I'm going to close this door quick. Uh, Frank is, is not going to come back from this with his prescriptions. And his doctor believes there is no antidote uh, in the natural remedy department. You have an A1C of 12. You are aging at six to seven times the rate you should if your metrics were as the doctor would want them. So when you look at reasons that the doctors lie, it isn't because they wake up and they're intentionally being deceptive. No, they're in a rush and I, I, they don't mean to be lying. They're just shortening the message because there's 20 minutes that you are supposed to cover like six or eight things um, that other doctors, well, they don't believe the patient can do it. It's been many times they've said, do this, do this. I mean, I can remember being there too. You know, here's what I need you to do. And they just don't believe the patient's going to do it. So they say, you can't do it. Uh, this isn't possible. You are beyond help in the way you're doing it. Do it my way. Uh, another reason doctors lie is the guidelines say this. Therefore, that must be all of the truth possible. 
And that's not true either. Um, so Frank's hemoglobin A1C was 12. Uh, and his, um, his prediction for a healthy, uh, rewarding life, the one he was planning on in his retirement after dealing with teenagers and teaching English for far too many years. Uh, actually, it's very, it's one of my favorite teachers now that my kids are in English, but um, I, I don't miss te parent teacher conferences because of talking to the English teacher. All right, I am going to drink some pucker up here. I don't think I'll change my numbers much with those kinds of reports of fasting, but um, I'm hungry. <laughs> It's going to taste good to me. But we're going to go right to the slides. A few, uh, a couple of years ago, you may remember these awesome slides uh, where we were teaching what's it really mean if an A1C is 12? What is this patient really trying to argue against? And this is a red blood cell. If we open the door and we look behind uh, the scenes of a red blood cell, we're going to find some proteins. Those proteins are hemoglobin. Uh, the hemoglobin have these little cups. Uh, actually, the proteins are called globin. The heme is the little yellow cups, and the iron is that little gray balls in each of those uh, uh, yellow cups. The, the oxygen that you see here is the point of your red blood cells. Hemoglobin holds on to these oxygen and deliver it to your, um, to your body. But if you have sugar at a high enough level, the sugar comes into too close of proximity to this heme unit with the iron at the bottom, and it splats on this parking spot where oxygen should go. Uh, in that moment, you're in trouble uh, because now the seat that was supposed to carry oxygen to your body is, well, it's defective for the rest of the lifestyle, life cycle of this red blood cell. And well, that means that your body's not getting the oxygen it deserves. But it also is a predictor of how much sugar is around there. So when we look at ideal numbers, here's a, um, oh, my, my head's in the wrong spot. Let's move that over here. Uh, here is a, um, an image of the, a red blood cell, and it's got oxygen in 100 seats. So if we were going to do percentages, this works out pretty well. Uh, if you look at what is an ideal um, percentage or average blood sugar around 100, um, that would equal five seats out of 100 or a 5% hemoglobin A1C. And as you look at a healthy number, this is what my goal is, is somewhere between 4.5 and under 5.2. Now, if you've followed this show long enough, you'll know that I've been up into the 5.5 range when I wasn't paying attention or thinking, I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, nothing like a 21-day metabolic course to clean up my habits. Um, but when you look at uh, Frank's problem, he has 12 uh, of his seats out of 100 taken up by this sugar. And, well, that's an average blood sugar of 300. The proteins inside his red blood cells are sugary. They're sticky. And it's changing the way his body can function. And they weren't sugary for like 10 minutes. They've been sugary for a while. This A1C is the average blood sugar over the last three months. And there are other proteins throughout the body. In the back of your eye, there are proteins. And when there's high sugars, it, it glycates the hemo, hemoglobin um, or glycated hemoglobin A1C. We're saying that that protein is glycated. It's got sugar on it and you glycate the problems in the back of an eye. You glycate the problems in a blood vessel. You even glycate the problems in skin or in your bladder or in the kidneys. Uh, specifically to this patient, there were some problems in, with joint pain. And yes, you can say, oh, I just got inflammation in my joints. I'm like, that's from that 12 hemoglobin A1C. The doctor wasn't lying when he said, you're aging way too fast. You need to stop this. And yet the patient said, well, I want to do this naturally. I'm like, well then, um, man up, we got some work to do. So if I look at um, the, uh, the changes that happen in this patient, um, it was a remarkable process that happened over a six-month time period. I have some notes here that I want to make sure I stayed on track for. And I think um, the... 
the, the real key here is, did, did Frank uh, guess right in that he, his doctor was lying to him? Uh, and was, was Frank telling all of the truth where he said, but doc, I just want to do this natural and I'll do anything it takes to not have one, one more of your prescription medications added to this. So before I tell you what happened to this, I am going to tell you a couple of updates that are going on in our channel. Uh, I will be quick about it, but it is really important that I do that. Let's see, I think it is. Uh, there we go. Yes, so on our website, I wanted to point out that um, in the Dr. Boz favorites, we have a couple of updates. Uh, one of them is still that Louisville is happening in October. That is getting a lot closer than it was. Um, as you uh, might have uh, um, been told, have heard me say several times, I have never been to Louisville. I'm super excited about going, and I will be hanging out there on, I think it's a Friday, Saturday, and I think I leave Sunday. Um, so there is this, um, let me pull, oopsie daisy, not that one. Uh, I'm trying to get my head to move, there we go. Nope, not going to do that either. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, is the, um, is where you click to see that. I also wanted to say that our prescription option for a um, continuous glucose monitor is back up and running. That was um, something we did this summer, and then we learned how much people wanted that, <laughs> uh, and we crashed the, we crashed our process. So we have really worked to make this a much more a pleasurable <laughs> experience for all the people, and I really will again say thank you to all those that did just hang in there with us when we got in nearly a thousand orders of um, this glucose monitor in a short time and the payment process was not hooked up to the person so we were having a tough tough time matching who's paid and who hasn't. Again, this is just the um, uh, uh, an option for you to get a continuous glucose monitor uh, by um, our collaboration with Meaningful Medicine. So there is a system and a process to go through um, don't, uh, don't be, um, um, so the, the payment that you pay for is to get, go through the process to be screened correctly and then to get the prescription. Um, you still have to go to the pharmacy and pick up the prescription and pay the pharmacist for this monitor. Uh, we had a lot of confusion for that. We've tried to have videos and education and frequently asked questions to, to answer the questions that everybody was asking. Um, yeah, this is the new thing I've been telling people about is I have picked my favorite sauna. We are trying to work on a video on that, but it's taking a lot longer than I thought. There are several other things on this website that I want to point out, but um, I also want to say thank you to the folks that have uh, clicked on my son and heard uh, his adventure. That's the last week that will be there. I also am actually really thankful for the invitation, not because my husband says I should put the Tesla link up there, but uh, because my I have been asked to uh, be a sponsor or a, an affiliate for the Levels, which also offers a continuous glucose monitor. Now, their program has a lot more um, education. Their program has a lot, it has several experts that can help you uh, through the, um, the process and get a consult. Uh, we, a Meaningful Medicine does not offer that. So if you're looking for that more one-on-one -on -one personalized contact, Levels does a great job of supplying you with not only the prescription, much like Meaningful Medicine does, but their support and their back, um, their background for um, connecting to people and really answering those questions is something. Well, I was th I was very flattered to be asked uh, to to do that with them. Um, a couple other things in our um, in our uh, let's go back to the top here. In our shop, uh, anybody who does buy, oh, I forgot to bring them in here. Anybody who does buy a product uh, does have a, a free uh, cycle breaker uh, that we are putting in um, the, uh, anybody who orders uh, any products from our website, uh, we will be sending the product as well as cycle breaker stickers. And if you were at group this morning and the pin chasers, I handed them out and we are really trying to, help people with grabbing onto that identity and breaking a cycle that's been there. Because indeed, that is what Frank was struggling with. So let's go back to that story. 
and um, talk a little bit more about what Frank was um, uh, was looking at. Let's go to uh, here. All right, so 64 years old, uh, in retirement, lots of problems, and his hemoglobin A1C is 12. And he walks into the doctor six months ago um, uh, and says, I need to do anything but this. This is not the answer that I want for the rest of my life. And he has actually been coming to group for a while, but was very respectful about newbies watch. Watch the group for several visits. And today he did a check-in and said, yeah, in six months, here's what he has accomplished. So let me go to here. Six months, he cut his carbs down to 10 carbohydrates per day. He had lost 50 pounds. His blood pressure was down. And his hemoglobin A1C was 4.8. 4.8, that is impressive. So his average blood sugar went from almost 300 having 12 spots per 100 covered with sugar, and now just under five slots are covered with sugar, so an average sugar of 91. But more importantly, um, oh, let's try to figure out if his doctor was lying when he said, hey, you are at risk of death. Um, so this is one of my favorite uh, slides and studies that looked at folks that were pretty close to uh, Frank's age. They were um, an average age of 69, so plus or minus in their 60s and 70s. Um, and they followed these people for eight years. They looked specifically at what is their hemoglobin A1C. And then they did not have any other specific lab follow-up. They didn't trend their uh, A1s, they, they didn't trend their um, hemoglobin A1Cs and checked them several times. They just said, how many of them died? And if you if their A1C was between 3.7 and 5.2, well, um, the hazard risk for dying was one. So think of that as like, well, that was the risk. As it went up to 5.3 to 5.7, then you had an increased risk of death. By the time it was 5.8 to 6.9, um, it was uh, now 1.3. It was twice the death rate if their A1C was above seven. And Frank's was 12. So was his doctor lying when he said, you're, you're, you're at 10 times the risk or whatever that the doctor quoted? Well, here's another way to look at this. Um, uh, actually, I want to go over to, um, uh, actually, I go to this and do, um, oh, actually, I want to go this way. I want to go to here. So there's, there because here's another study. This one is a study from Lancet, I believe. Um, and it was uh, looking at primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, specifically looking at statins. Uh, this one that they used was a torvastatin. Um, and they looked at it in these type 2 diabetics. Um, the type 2 diabetics, we know, have a high risk of heart disease. We know that by lowering their lipids, um, we are going to significantly help the patients um, well, live longer, uh, be healthier. Uh, what his doctor said is um, when uh, he showed up at six months, down 55 pounds. Well, his doctor was astonished, uh, praising him for all of his weight loss. He also said, yeah, and uh, good job on that A1C. But your total cholesterol went up from 250 to 300. And uh, as much as the doctor said, yep, good job on that improvement of your weight loss, uh, but that cholesterol went up and we need to start you on a statin. And the guy pushed back and said, I, I don't want to be on that statin. Um, I think uh, my, my risk is much lower than it was. Um, and the doctor said, if you go on this statin, we know we will lower your risk of a heart attack by 25%. So there's another statement. Is the doctor lying there? And that's where the study comes back in. So let me go back to uh, here. 
this this is the, the statin, one of the most common, and this is the study where doctors say we are lowering your risk of a heart attack by 25%. You need to take this statin. Uh, so I'm gonna go down to the, um, the, actually I'll read the interpretation first because I think it helps um, just summarize what, uh, why this, this study, specifically this study matters so much. So uh, it says here that when they took 10 milligrams per day, um, these were people uh, with the first risk was cardiovascular disease and stroke, and they were type 2 diabetes. They were looking at reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke. Um, that they said there is uh, now, because they were able to show this reduction of 25%, that there is no justification for having a, any particular threshold of LDL cl cholesterol, meaning there is no cholesterol that's not worthy of a statin if you have diabetes because of this study. <clears throat> and the debate about whether all people with this disorder meaning diabetes, uh, warrant statin, statin treatment should now focus on whether any patients are sufficiently low risk for this tre treatment to be withheld. So they have flipped it. They've said, no, everybody with diabetes should be on a statin, period, because of this study. Now, I want to show you, uh, you can read the study, and it's, uh, it's actually kind of frustrating to me to read. Uh, I want to get to the chart that I really like. Um, so here um, is the all-cause mortality that they showed in this study. And they started out this study with, let me make this a little bit smaller there. Um, they started out this study with um, 1,400 in the placebo, a little over 1,400 in, with the statin rate. By the time they're at the end of this, they've got 300 versus 350. And these are the two endpoints that they said, yes, every patient should be on a statin if they are diabetic. And the truth is, the doctors now have this as a default. It is, if you go to the doctor and you have diabetes, well, this is what they're saying. You, you got to be on a statin. You got to be on a statin. Let me show you, um, go back to the slides and show you why. Is, is the doctor lying? Uh, okay, so I want to, I think I want to do this. Oops, I got to do this. No, this way. Go back to this. All right, so um, I'm going to pull this guy down and do that in a minute. Um, okay, so here we go. So um, these pills that he was prescribing, it was a statin, are going to reduce your risk for the, a heart attack, for actually all-cause mortality was this one, by 25%. The problem is that uh, what they're talking about here is the relative risk. What does that mean? Well, um, it isn't the absolute risk. An absolute risk would be closer to something like this, that if you do not take the prescription and you were in that study, um, about one in 4,000 like you were going to have uh, the heart attack. When you look at those who took the medication, well, it was one in 5,000. And the reduction of 25% less chance was the mathematical answer. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's very scary, and I can I can remember the uh, the drug reps coming in and you know, really sh throwing out numbers at me, saying, "Yes, your uh, you should here's why you should use this drug. Here's why you need to do this. We have proven this." And of course, they're taking the language right out of that study, and you know, saying, "Doctor, you are against guidelines if you do not do this." And indeed, they're right. The guidelines do say, "If you're diabetic, quit asking questions." When you look at, in order to get this to fit on the slide, I just want you to notice we had to reduce this to this is the 1%. This is uh, 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 of the percentage points for the, um, the actual risk instead of the relative risk. Uh, this is how tiny we needed to keep the line between 1 in 4,000 and 1 in 5,000 on what that medication was doing. I mean, the difference of this, um, of what this doctor was saying to the patient is, well, it's not a lie. It's just not the whole truth. And when, when I've been asked to say, well, doc, should I just tell my doctor that I've, um, you know, 
I mean, sh should I tell them that I'm carnivore? Because you're going to guess that um, uh, when he said, yeah, doc, I I'm keto uh, or I'm, I'm eating all meat. <laughs> the truth is, uh, the doctor pushed right back and said, no, I need you on a lower calorie, uh, on low fat. S seriously, was, this was said in the last four months. Uh, and you ha have to be, actually not four months, within the last month or so, because it was six months since January 1st uh, that he had this follow-up visit with his doctor. Uh, and he's like, I don't, I don't want to fight with my doctor. And I, uh, the way I learned this was I went to YouTube. I found uh, me, Dr. Boz. I found uh, Dr. Fung. I found Dr. Westman. And I learned about the ketogenic diet by listening to YouTube. And so I told him, well, um, don't tell him that you're eating keto carnivore and feel great. Uh, but what you could tell him is, yeah, I've cut out sugar, processed foods, and grains. And I've done this, and now I feel great. And what will happen is, well, your doctor will at least not repel the information that you're sending them. That when I look at patients who uh, would come in saying, I know the answer to all my problems, it it is a very strong adversarial moment when they're like, here's what I need you to do. Now, their intentions were great. And, and it was for many years that I said these exact same words. I don't think <coughs> I was lying. Mm. I don't also think that I was explaining relative risk and absolute, actually, I probably didn't even know that, that, that they were spewing out relative risk versus um, absolute risk when I was talking about the statistics of statins at the time. Uh, I mean, that, that this outcome is, I should look at what year it was. I, I, I did a few hours ago, but I can't remember. When, when I look at, um, when patients come to me and say, well, what are the things that um, would help my doctor learn about a ketogenic diet? The truth is, there is nothing more powerful than a patient who gets healthy. That This guy, I told, keep going back to that doctor and keep watching YouTube, <laughs> keep learning about your health. Uh, we'll do our best to not overpromise on a YouTube channel. It's, it's actually something I really do work hard at to say, here's what I can tell to a crowd. Uh, here's what I can tell to people in a, a more intimate setting, like in our classes that we held today. Um, and I can more specifically have a back and forth question and answer to say, well, if you were my patient, this is what I would do. Until then, the most powerful thing that man can do is before this patient, that doctor who doesn't tell lies on purpose, that doctor had a, um, a, a notch in his learning when the patient's uh, A1C went from 12 to 4.8, 4.9, whatever it was. And the first time I saw that, it changed the way I thought too. Uh, so when I, when patients come in and say, did my doctor lie to me? No, uh, he probably didn't tell the whole truth. And there are many of them that should spend a little time on YouTube <laughs> looking at some of the testimonies and some of the other physicians saying, uh, how else do we get this information out to patients in a way that's safe. Uh, I have another story coming up of somebody who said, ah, I, I, the doctors didn't know what they were talking about and he did some things that weren't so safe. Uh, but this patient really did buy the workbook, followed along saying, this is what I do with my patients. I mean, the workbook cost 12 bucks or something and he uh, you know, followed along with what I was teaching along with some of the other physicians that he trusted. And um, as he showed up back at his doctor, the first visit did not go so well. The first visit was filled with uh, a bit of, um, like, you know, uh, dis uh, um, the dissidence of seeing what you expect to happen and not being there. Cognitive dissidence, there you go, <laughs> where he's looking at him and saying, okay, you're the diabetic where I tried to prescribe that, you were the 12. And to resort that patient down to a 4.8 on an A1C, yeah, that's not possible. <laughs> not in that quick of a moment. Uh, we are going to get to your questions here in just a second. Um, and I have um, a few other um, uh, folks that had really good questions in class today. So I got to visit um, a couple of them. And 
Um, well, actually, we don't have any questions that are on the on the board yet. So put your questions in. My team will find them and post them on the board. Um, and um, uh, in the spirit of using this as a teachable moment, uh, I I will tell you that um, my blood sugar uh, is I, I keep track of it on my on my continuous glucose monitor. Um, let me see here. Uh, I'll show you what my numbers were today. Because I did sync them with my um, my Mojo app. I, I woke up this morning and did a a workout. Uh, and to, you know, Tuesdays are the hardest workout. Tuesdays I have been not I have not eaten since Sunday. And when I do really good before um, the um, before, oh yeah, here we go. Um, and I do really good before the. Yeah, here's my blood sugar right now. A 68 is what I'm at right now, but it's been really low throughout. Um, you can see when I run my finger over, I think I can tell you the exact number. Um, there we go. Yeah, as I look at 4.30 in the afternoon and then go back to this morning's number, 6.30 a.m., but that's after the workout. I was trying to go further than that. Let's go 24 hours. Okay, here we go. Oh, yeah, there's my blood. See where it got really low right there? Let me drag my finger there. That's when I was working out. And I did not feel great. Uh, yeah, I started the workout at 65. Uh, right. Cut up at 5. So the workout started at 5.30. And yeah, it got down to uh, 65 when I started the workout. And then by the time I got done with the workout, it was probably 6.30 when I got done with the workout. So somewhere in there. So you can see that, that rise in blood sugar after I did the workout. And then it goes back down. And now it's 68 and whatever it was a few minutes ago when I tested it. Um, either my either my form is not updating or there are no questions here on the form. Hmm. Let's just give it another hot minute here to see if any. Oh, here they are. Okay, I just refreshed and found all your questions. Here we go. That was my bad. Uh, let me share that screen. Um, okay, so um, let's see here. Hmm. Let's go to. I have a couple things I need to do here. No, not that one. Um, You let me do that. Well, all right. Uh, that's not how I like it to look. But um, so Mike writes in and says, I have heard, oopsie daisy, now it's moving when I don't want it to. I have heard that we should not have lab, uh, blood labs done for a while after we start keto. I'm on a statin due to high LDL, triglycerides, and low HDL. Uh, when can I get my labs rechecked? Oh, so it's a great question, Mike. Um, when I look at, um, uh, folks asking that question. This guy came in over the last few months too and heard me say, yeah, wait till you're at least six months into the ketogenic diet before you look at your cholesterol. Uh, that first wave of cholesterol happens when you add a lot of fat, everybody's cholesterol is going to go up. But what's interesting is uh, they don't have, um, the, I mean, especially if they can stay, I mean, this guy was great. He put, he said, I am a creature of habit. I'm going to start a habit that I haven't had before, and um, that will be, um, you know, cutting my carbohydrates down to 10. It took about, you know, some sort, some time passed before he added exercise of going for a walk every, uh, so he added exercise, he cut out all the carbohydrates, and, um, and then this was the six-month um, uh, time after he got that drawn. Uh, what I didn't say, and I meant to say, was they um, they had his triglycerides were almost, I mean, dramatically better than before. So his triglycerides went down. His LDL cholesterol went from two hundred and sixty to three hundred, which is nothing uh, uh, relative to a drop in his hemoglobin A one C. 
because hemoglobin A1C mattered most. That was the point of the whole lecture. Uh, when a hemoglobin A1C is, is that high, the average blood sugar and what that glycation was doing to his body was the most important thing for him to uh, fix before he ever worries about cholesterol. So when people ask, when should I recheck, you know, should I recheck my labs? The answer is, well, um, if, is your A1C still dramatically dropping? So you can check your A1C uh, on your own. You don't need a uh, doctor's visit to do it. Um, my finger actually has a Band-Aid on it because, uh, see this test right here? I, I finally did my vitamin D and my A1C today. I meant to do it about two weeks ago, but then I put the kit aside and forgot to do it. Um, but you prick your finger, put the blood on the sponge, and send it into the lab. And boy, it is a, um, it's a, uh, good little test, but if that A1C, if he would have checked his A, when his A1C had dropped from 12 to about 7, it, it wasn't at steady state yet. I believe it truly is at steady state now that he has had two of those three-month cycles uh, for his red blood cells to turn over twice. A whole new crop of red blood cells comes out every uh, 90 to 100 days, so about every three months. So at the six-month part, he is definitely uh, um, much further into his uh, Ability. Um, okay, so um, all right, I want uh, to go back to my questions and um, go to Leslie. Uh, I have been in ketosis uh, with ketones above one and had a Dr. Boss ratio uh, below 60 for three months. What is happening to my metabolism? Because I have lost, uh, I have lost weight during this time. What is happening to my metabolism because I have lost weight during this time? Okay, well, with a Dr. Boss ratio of one point uh, of uh, 60 with a ketones above one, yeah, you have a higher metabolic burn when you're in ketosis like that. The, the first thing that I, I am always, first of all, praise somebody for being able to stay in a persistent ketogenic state. Um, Leslie, I wonder if, um, oh, they've got the question here twice. I I haven't lost weight is what this one says. I haven't lost weight. Well, I don't know. She's in there twice, guys. You got, can't do that to me on live television. Okay, I've been in ketosis for three months. Ketones for 1.0. Um, I haven't lost weight during, so what others might be occurring. Okay. Let's go to here. So here's what I think she's asking is that, um, a ketogenic state is um, uh, showing you that you have ketones in circulation. Uh, that is a chemistry set that makes it very easy for your body to lose weight. When they say, but doc, I'm not losing weight. Um, once your metabolism is in a place where you can, you can flux between, flex between using glucose and using ketones, and they say, hey, I'm doing what you said. I have ketones of 1.0. I have a Dr. Boz ratio of 60 or less for three months. Why haven't I lost weight? So you have the chemistry set. Now you have to flex your metabolism. You have to push your system. Um, when we say um, a keto continuum, it means that getting you to the chemistry set where we can push on your metabolism is how you lose the weight. You've got the chemistry set. You now need to make the next step. So depending on where you're at in this set state, um, is the, um, is, is, is the answer to what you're asking. So this is great when I can have a back and forth conversation. Uh, I would guess, I'm just going to guess that, um, if you're a female and you're writing in and you're trying to lose weight, that you've, um, had that weight for a while. Um, the most common mistake that I see patients with this story have is they have a way that they have been able to boost their ketones. Either they're taking MCT um, or they're having enough fat and they are good ketone producers. That's the other thing. There are some people who really do make ketones faster and better. And the, the brilliant part of that is it is easier for you to lose weight, but you still have to flex and extract the fat, which is the source of the ketones um, from your fat cells. 
So most of the time, someone who's got this story is got too wide of an eating window or is eating too late at night. And I go through that in the book. If you haven't read Keto Continuum, it's a great audio book. There's a workbook that comes with it. And you'll find yourself somewhere around uh, the place where David did his first 36-hour fast. And then watch what happens. You have the chemistry set. You have what many people can't get. And now you need to use it. So, all right, let's move to uh, Cheryl. Um, uh, let's go here. Cheryl says, hi, from Rhode Island. My cholesterol is up to 319. On the other hand, my glucose is down to 5.5. I'm not sure why. Okay, well, glucose is what falls first. Um, again, we want, the, we want the hemoglobin A1C. to That matters most. That is more important than chasing your LDL cholesterol. If your hemoglobin A1C sneaks up, like I don't even like it north of 5.5. I had a 5.6 about a year ago, and I, I tell patients not to do that. I don't want mine to do that. Um, that I, again, I just checked, uh, pricked my finger today. I have the Band-Aid on to show it, that that A1C, I'm hoping for mine to be at least really close to five, if not, um, I hope it's under 5.5. The, the cholesterol, there's um, several lectures I've done on um, what really matters with cholesterol. And it has a lot to do with what size of particle do you have? How many of the particles do you have in cholesterol? What is your ApoB, which is a much better um, response than, um, uh, if you're going to measure one metric, total cholesterol Got, it's got too much noise in what really it really means. Um, so the good news is you must fix the A1C first. I'd get your A1C down to 5 or at least 5.1 and then check your, your cholesterol. We can answer that better once, you're, once your blood sugars are better controlled. So again, you get more power in preventing health problems by getting that A1C as close to 5 or under 5. Um, before you start worrying about what your cholesterol is doing. Okay, uh, let's go back to the question. Uh, Jason writes, uh, how should I incorporate salt since I have high blood pressure? Well, you need to be listening to a few more of my, uh, my lectures. <laughs> so it's a great question, Jason. I get this a lot. Um, when I look at the, the number one reason that blood pressure goes high in most people, and again, one of the most amazing reversals of blood pressure is to lower the blood sugar. That, that molecule of glucose or sugar is, um, is pulling water or attracting water because of its osmotic effect. It's, it's pull to keep water in circulation is very powerful when you are on the ketogenic diet uh, when you're, and you have a high blood sugar. As you decrease the carbohydrates, and decrease that sugar in circulation, you get rid of a bunch of fluid. And it is for that reason that, I mean, I've had patients get off of five or six blood pressure medicines in a week um, because they dropped their carbs so stinking fast and they were so inflamed. Um, just today on one of the support groups in the 21 day class, uh, uh, the guy was saying, well, why is my blood pressure different on this day and that day? And Right there on camera, I had him get his leg up in front of the, the, the Zoom camera and said, now push on your shin. And we talked about this shin thumbprint that helps me see, well, how much swelling is in between your cells. And that link to blood pressure is highly correlated. Uh, when you have increased interstitial fluid, uh, you're on the wrong side of that osmotic pressure. That fluid should be in circulation, not stuck between your cells. And although salt, sugar will follow salt, doctors will say, lower that salt, lower that salt. Um, what they really should be saying is, we aren't going to talk about the salt until you lower the blood sugar, until the average blood sugar is 5.1. Again, if you want a really good explanation of this and an example of a patient who, man, messed it up in every way you can find, um, it's in that it's in the book that I wrote keto continuum uh, the first book I wrote was about my mom and how I came into the ketogenic diet and then I had so many patients people asking to be my patient I'm like I can't see all of you um, but here's the workbook that I do to get you keto because you don't often need to see a doctor to be keto 
But if you have high blood pressure, there are some rules. And if you follow the workbook that goes with Keto Continuum, you'll see, hey, here's how you, and I do a much better job of explaining it in there than I'm doing here tonight. Um, all right, question next is, over the past two weeks, I've developed serious shortness of breath with little exertion, with a very little exertion. I have three plus pitting edema in my right leg only, a cough, dizziness when standing. No, this is probably not an electrolyte balance. Lindsay, that sounds like a blood clot. You need to see a doctor. Um, I do not give medical advice on this, but that sounds very dangerous. Okay, when on a, uh, when, when is a diabetic on insulin too far gone for, for keto to help? Well, I think you should pick up the Women's World magazine, uh, Bernie. The Women's World magazine has this wonderful, oh, I don't have a copy of it here with me, uh, wonderful story of, uh, the, it's the one with uh, Emerald on it, and it was when they called me to interview uh, about the sardine challenge. But this woman had an A1C, I mean, it was double digits. I can't remember if it was 11 or 12, on insulin, and, and she was in her early 50s or maybe late 60s. Uh, early 50s, early to late 50s, when she was on insulin. She got on the ketogenic diet and she had, she didn't just play with it. She followed the numbers and did what, she actually took the 21 day course last year. And um, she is off all of her medications, including insulin. Uh, her blood pressure is normal. She's down to her high school weight because she followed the steps, not just doing what the gal asked a couple of questions ago, which is, hey, I've got good ketones. Okay, that's step one, but there is a continuum for a reason. You've got to keep pushing that metabolism in order to get the weight loss that goes with it. So it's a very good question, and I, I believe uh, that it is in a, a doctor's duty to not give up hope um, for a patient when it comes to health. That, um, you know, go home and get your affairs in order. Those are very rare conversations. Yes, we're all going to die. But that catastrophic, there's nothing more that you can do, the kind of despair that this English teacher heard from his doctor, which is, you, you are a too far gone conclusion. You cannot reverse an A1C of 12. Well, by golly, he did. He did it in, in six months with 55 pounds and to a place where his doctor should have praised him, not scolded him to say, your, LDL, your total cholesterol went up to, to three, 200 or whatever. Yeah, went up to 200. Uh, yeah, they missed the point there. So I believe that especially when people are, um, you know, they're, tr they, they're willing to try. I mean, there's a couple of, uh, of my favorites that are on this page that they, they did. They came, they tried, they gave it their all. They got their numbers better. And their, well, their beta cells aren't working anymore, the cells that produce insulin. And as they got better, their beta cells had, well, they they took a hit and they're not producing enough insulin. But with a small amount of long acting insulin, they can have the health that we all talk about. That would not have been possible from me or anybody else 10 years ago. We didn't know how powerful lowering carbohydrates would be because we all worried about what this guy's doctor was worried about, which is, oh my gosh, the cholesterol went up. And I think um, denying patients hope is a, well, I think it's a downright sin for a doctor to do that. Um, truthful, but um, you should, I wouldn't, too far gone for keto to help. Bernie, I think you need to stick around here, buy the audio book and listen to the book that I, there, there's a great story in, in that there that you could probably learn a lot from. All right, uh, we'll do two more questions here. Um, uh, Julie writes in and says, hi, I'm, on, I'm new to keto and excited to get started. However, I'm about to start a new job. Is there a way to keep my energy level up and avoid the keto flu symptoms? Oh, that's a great question, Julie. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so if you do get that workbook, I don't know, do I have a copy of that here? Oh, I gave one away. Well, it's cheap. It's like 15 bucks on Amazon, Keto Continuum Workbook. There are a few steps that if you have been a huge carb eater in the past, um, I, I tell folks, uh, be careful. If, you, if you're in the 200 club, which means you eat more than 200 carbs per day, and then you slam it down to what we know is going to be needed for you to be in ketosis, well, you can get yourself a little, a little um, 
I mean, the keto flu is what happened. So the antidotes to the keto flu are either go gradual or, oh, I have not been drinking this very well, uh, to drink ketones before you, do, to, before you really drop them. So I tell people, sip on um, either, this one doesn't taste very good, the, key, the, the pucker up. Um, it's not sweet at all. So I would order any of the ones that I sell besides pucker up because uh, they, have a, they have stevia in it. So it's a little sweeter. And when people first come to the ketogenic uh, lifestyle, the sweetness is what they miss. Um, and so having that as you read and, or listen to the audiobook uh, for Keto Continuum, that will get you the steps of, what, of how to prepare. And it does not need to be long. It does not need to be hard. I'm a big believer in starting on a certain day and then, then staying the course. But I'm a much bigger believer to say, read before you do that. If you have been carb addicted, if you've got a lot of carbs in your life, and if you've got medical problems or a significant amount of weight to lose, um, the first week can be hell. So I don't want you to lose your job. It's totally preventable if ketones are around. And that means you can swallow them and hack it, which is what I'm telling you to do. The, the pucker up is fine to, for most people who've been keto for a while because you lose your sweetness, meaning I don't want uh, sweet things as much. I don't. In fact, when I have something sweet, it's often too sweet. And that was like the craziest thing for anybody to say to me. Like, too sweet, there's no such thing. <laughs> I love sugar. Uh, but now I, I use pucker up because it's sour. It tastes like lemon juice. Um, and uh, if you drink, if you simp on ketones for a week before you start keto, and then try to cut down carbs before you slam them down and say 20 total carbohydrates or less, that's how you get to, into ketosis. And that's how you really lose the weight. But if you're trying to avoid the flu, you gotta you gotta hack the system a little. And so I do explain it in that book a little better. All right, uh, TQV. Uh, when I uh, let's go back so you can see what I'm saying. When I exercise, even uh, if it's walking on a very hot day, I'm and sweating, my blood sugar goes to a hundred from eighty. Why does that happen? Won't this raise my hemoglobin A1C? Oh, that's such a good question. Very good question. Um, okay, so uh, the truth is when you exercise muscles, especially when you're, you're telling me a good clue there, you sweat. So you are pushing your metabolism. This is really what the gal who's saying, hey, I'm in ketosis. Why am I not losing weight? Uh, she needs to flex her metabolism. She needs to push her metabolism. She's got the chemistry set to do it, but she's not using it. Um, you're using it and saying, well, why is my blood sugar going up? First of all, good job in checking your blood sugar. But as you noticed in my, in my blood sugars, you can see it rise even when I was probably in gluconeogenesis because I woke up, I think my blood sugar this morning was 58 when I woke up. Um, and, but my muscles are in need of um, glucose. So as they are working, any stinking little morsel of glycogen that's in my muscles, uh, will, it will empty into circulation so that the muscle can be fed. The glucose in, or the glycogen in your liver is what usually drops when you're fasting. But to get it to empty out of the muscle cells, which is a bigger storage bank than your liver, just because of mass. So we store way more glycogen in our, in our muscles than we do in our liver. I mean, simply from cell count. I mean, there's way more muscle cells in our body than there are liver cells. But the liver is the response organ. As soon as you stop eating, it's going to empty out the storage in your liver first. When you go to use your muscles, you go for this walk, you sweat. Well, now your muscles are saying, oh, well, I got some stored glycogen. I, I tucked it away in case she needed it. And that's where the blood sugars will rise during exercise and then um, settle down. You say, well, won't that affect my A1C? Don't do that. Do not think that way. You, are, you want to plunge that, those glycogen out of storage. You want to empty the stored glycogen from your muscle cells. I mean routinely. That's what, why we should be exercising routinely. Now, I don't talk about that a lot on the show because I really do, most people tune into this because they want to lose weight. And although exercise is a part of this, I've been telling patients to exercise since 1998, the year I became a doctor. That's what I told them, and 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 they didn't. You cannot lose weight if your metabolism is wrong. This lady who wrote in a question a few ago saying, hey, I've got these ketones. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're the easiest one to help. This is so easy. Just do the next step. It's a continuum. Do the next step. 
uh, and when you do that, if you're wearing a, a continuous glucose monitor, you'll see, oh, my blood sugar went up. And when it plunges that high, it means you've probably got a lot of sugar stored in your muscles. So using them, causing a sweat, whether it's from the sauna or exercise, is a very powerful health benefit. And to say, oh, is it going to change the area under the curve for my A1C for the three-month average? Well, you're going in the right direction because as soon as you empty those glycogen, any blood sugar in storage will, it'll go back into storage. But it's out of circulation. It's in storage. That's a good place for it. That's where it's supposed to be. I, I, I tease, not tease, I talk to patients about um, when, they're, when their glycogen has been stuck in their liver or stuck in their um, muscles for so long, uh, it crystallizes. No, it doesn't actually crystallize, but it gets like stiff, like it's not going to move. Like you have to flex your metabolism and have the right chemistry set to move that glucose out of that stored glucose in the form of glycogen out of your muscle cells. And that's why you get a blood sugar like that. Um, all right, so let's see. I think that is a good wrap for the day. Um, there are a couple more questions that are, that are pretty good, but it is the top of the hour and uh, I'm going to check my blood sugar. Uh, I didn't do much of that. I didn't drink much of this. I only had like the top, top third. Mm. But um, let's see how my numbers turned out. And mm. um, I wonder if it'll. I wonder if it's changed it at all. Mm. Yeah, uh, as I am in this 21 day, I get to meet, again, all these new patients, new, not patients, new people. Um, but uh, it's been fantastic to see uh, the ones that are returning and how much healthier they are than the last time I saw them. So again, blood sugar's down to hmm, 68. Uh, there you, okay, here we go. Uh, 68 and ketones counting down here to uh, 4.2. Boy, I did raise it. Huh, who knew? Okay, well, uh, that's a wrap for tonight. And the two things I'm doing to break my fast is I'm going to have pork tonight with carnivore crisps. I put some Redmond salt in there. And when I've done a really hard fast and a couple of workouts, sometimes I get a little diarrhea when I break my fast. But if I put these in ahead of time, I don't. You can find both of these on my favorites page. All right, folks. Uh, again, love to see uh, you guys in uh, 